two teams, two games, one day, two spots in the Sweet 16 on the line. That's all you got to know, really. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another episode of Locked on Baylor, a special edition episode, weekend episode of Locked on Baylor. I am your host, Cam Stewart from ESPN Central Texas out here in Memphis, Tennessee. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day on the scene today, right outside the FedEx Forum where the Baylor men's team is going to take on Brad Brownell's Clemson Tigers to see if this Big 12 conference is is really manipulating things or not, I guess. Ladies still out in Blacksburg, Virginia. The pollen has has come up in Memphis. You might be able to to tell later on in the show. Ladies in Blacksburg taking on the host Virginia Tech Hokies, a very shorthanded Virginia Tech Hokies, and by that I mean missing one of the best players in the entire country, and Elizabeth Kitley. We'll we'll talk about that and and hear from Coach Nikki Collin on on how they will attack the Hokies without their dominant All American post player. But looking at the men's game first, Baylor looked Baylor looked like the best offense in the entire tournament on on Friday. You know, I mean, yeah, I guess Colorado and, and Florida put up a hundred in their game, but uh, they just looked so efficient. They, it looked as good as it's looked all year. Uh, it looked like the one that we thought we had in the non conference schedule. But when you go into the best conference in America, that that's not what offense is going to look like. It's just not. And still, Baylor was able to persist and be one of the best offenses in the entire conference. And then the game right after that, Baylor won by 25. Clemson went out one by 21 as underdogs, according to Vegas, uh, with that New Mexico Lobos team. But as Brandon McKinnon told you, and as I told you then, because Brandon McKinnon convinced me, that was too too much hype around an 11 seed in New Mexico. I I think we see 11 seeds are starting to win a lot more in the first round. They were three and one again this year for the second time in three years. In fact, New Mexico was the only one that lost. Uh, so that's that's becoming the new 12-5 is the 11-6. And so now we're we're really hyping up these teams. And look, New Mexico had talent, but uh, you know Jalen House and and um, and what's his name Jamal Mashburn Jr. had just bad, bad shooting games. And not to say that New Mexico couldn't have won that if they didn't shoot 29% from the floor. I, I think that was a huge help in, in Clemson's direction. But Clemson did not look like the slouch that that I think Vegas thought they were, is kind of, kind of what that was. Um, so they come in with all kinds of confidence. You know, they, they feel they can beat just about anybody. And what you've got is the three seed in the West with the number one strength of schedule in the country. And it is going to be a fun, fun matchup. And Clemson, I'm not going to sit here and say Clemson is playing their best basketball of the year uh, because that's not true. They did just lose to BC by 20 plus points in the ACC tournament, the, the game before they just played against New Mexico. But that game Friday is what is what they look like when they're at their best, if that makes sense. You know, they they, they had things clicking. Um, Chase Ford, who, you know, had, had a dreadful game against BC, who's in the postgame presser in that game, said he let the whole university down, uh, puts the team on his back in, in this game against New Mexico, goes for over 20 and is no doubt their best player. They got that kid, Gerard, who can really shoot it from three. Um, when he gets hot, he is he is as good as anyone in that conference shooting the three. So uh, so that's the, that's the backcourt. But what this team actually focuses on and what Scott Drew and his team will focus on is the frontcourt. Uh, they are very versatile. They have a bunch of big guys they can throw at you. Um, and that certainly brought up the question yesterday of, is Eve Misi ready to play? Because Eve kind of gets banged up early in that in that game against Colgate, he he told me uh, yesterday that it was it was the back, it was not the ribs, it was his back, uh, and that he was a little banged up, just kind of the regular knocks that you get playing in the Big Twelve, and then that kind of aggravated him on Friday, but said he felt good by the end of the game. Scott Drew said Eve is good to go as well, and said how important 
his freshman center would be in this game. Well, you definitely definitely want a, a healthy interior because uh, you're going to need them all. And uh, Clemson's as deep in the front line as you're going to find in college basketball. Uh, most college teams are lucky if they have one guy who can play in the post. Uh, they got they got three, four, five guys they can run in there. So um, with us, I know uh, uh, Eve did a great job uh, trying to fight through the other day. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, you'll be in better shape physically. Um, Dave Snyder, our trainer, does a great job with that. Charlie Melton, our strength coach. So uh, anyway, uh, and Eve's a tough kid. So Scott basically saying it there. They can throw out, Clemson can throw out four or five big guys that are in there and, and ready to play. And he's right in that not a lot of teams can say that. Now, I will say, I, I have not watched a lot of Clemson this whole year, but Baylor's athleticism is, is a little bit better. So I, I, I don't think it'll be as drastic as that A&M Nebraska game that we had here in Memphis on Friday where they just looked like they were playing two different sports and, and, and Nebraska was just big and slow and, and A&M was, was long and very athletic. I, I don't think it's quite like that. But there, there are a few centers in the country who can live with Eve Nisi. And the kid's getting better every game. He is obviously a freak athlete. There's just not many who can guard him. And if you don't have an athletic wing out there, you just have a big body out there, it's going to be tough to stick with Jalen Bridges. So I, I think Baylor can get at them a little bit with their athleticism underneath. Again, not a, not a drastic uh, dip in athletic form that Clemson has. But I think that's that's an advantage, Baylor. And I talked about this after the game on Friday. It There is some randomness, some luck to shooting 16 of 30 from three like Baylor did against Colgate. But then again, that that's just going up against a different kind of team than you were going up against for two and a half months. You know, Colgate came out they were physical all the players talked about that with me yesterday that they, they they were physical and what they wouldn't quite say was they just weren't Colgate wasn't athletic enough to to compete with Baylor and 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 that doesn't show itself necessarily by get to the basket and dunking it so much as it shows Baylor is getting space and that space was utilized really well behind the three-point arc and that was space that they did not get in in the whole regular season and the in, in the conference schedule, I should say. They they just didn't see anything quite like that. And, you know, Clemson is still coming out of the ACC, which I dump on a lot, but it is a major conference still. Uh, they have a good defense, not of the physicality and of the level that, that we see in the Big 12. So does that mean Baylor's going to go out there and score 90 points and win by 25? No, but... It is something to to think about that that this offense could be as good could be as good this weekend as we've seen it the whole season if they are able to attack that that kind of lack of Big Twelve I guess is the way to put that but uh, yeah so Eve seems to be ready to go um, pretty much pretty much everyone is you know you knew you didn't have Langston Love and that stinks but getting getting through this tournament is also making sure you you have their people healthy from game to game and it, it might be a slow start because of you know the quick turnaround that's that's what this tournament does uh, but I think Baylor has really set themselves up well for that uh, we, we saw it a couple of times in the non-conference including the NIT preseason NIT up in uh, up in Brooklyn where they played two games in three days same case uh, the last couple of weeks of the conference schedule with that Houston to TCU and that Kansas to Texas turnaround Saturday to Monday. That is was absolutely intentional in the non-conference and worked out very well in the Big 12 because Scott Drew doesn't necessarily schedule that. So um that that is a great preparation for what this tournament is in terms of a toll on your body. And we're going to see how Baylor reacts to that in this game tonight because as 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 great as it was to get that practice of that two games in three days at the end of the regular season, you'll remember the second game of those TCU on the road, very slow start. Uh, they were tied at halftime, but they only, I think it was 23, 23. Like it was a rock fight in the first half before Baylor pulled away. And then the second one, Texas, they were down 14 in the first half. They played one of their worst halves of the season in that first half. And they did come back to win, but, but a, a slow start like that, th this is not Texas. 
<laughs> this is this is the NCAA tournament, and this is a team with a bit more of a killer instinct than Texas has in, in Clemson. So uh, you can't afford to have that kind of start. The ladies had a great start to the tournament. So, you know, that, that's pretty cool. And I actually, I kind of fancy their chances today. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I think I think Baylor has a really good chance of winning on the road, or as good as a chance as they could have hoped, I guess, uh, on the road, taking on Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. But first, I got to tell you about how today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because you can say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel is going to let you bet on every game of the tourney. So whether you're betting that big upset or the one seed, it's time to go dancing with America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on the point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win the whole thing. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops all the way till they cut down those nets in Phoenix. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And looking at the ladies' side of things, it's a true road game out in Blacksburg, Virginia. But they looked impressive, I thought, against Vanderbilt. Um, I, I, I kind of said, I said beforehand that I would rather see Vanderbilt than than Columbia, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily easy. And they they did the things that I think we were waiting on, right? I, I kind of talked about, and because Nikki Collin talked about this, uh, how that rest could benefit them in almost two weeks before playing because they needed to get their shooters back. And and part of that is getting them rested up, getting them a lot of time in the gym, getting them shooting against air, uh, but which can actually be a beneficial thing. And it, it's certainly, certainly helped in this game. I mean, I look at the two things I've looked at for the last month or so, month and a half with these, with these ladies, and that is three-point shooting percentage and rebounding. Nikki Collins said it, said it a couple of times, but most recently after that Iowa State game, when we're getting out rebounded, we're not going to win. And that that is that rings true quite a bit. When you look at their games, if they're getting beaten up in the post, whether it's rebounding or points in the paint, they lose those games. They don't win the games in the post. They win games beyond the arc, even though that's not necessarily how they should be built. But uh, that that's what's happened, and that's what they're rolling with. And for you look at the splits, uh, both teams took a similar amount of three pointers in this game. Baylor and Vanderbilt. Vandy went three for 17, which is 17%. They were shot nine of 21, which is 43%. 43% three-point shooting is going to win you a lot of games. A lot of games. And I look at the rebounding. They were plus five, you know, plus three on the offensive glass, plus two on the defensive glass. So you win both of those and win the overall rebounding. That's how you win the game. And for this one, they were dominated. I mean, they weren't re really tested in this game. Um I, I thought they played good defense the whole way. Um, I, I I don't think they were that loose with the ball. And then I look and I see they have 19 turnovers, but um, they, they forced two more than they gave up. So I'll, I'll take that. Um, and they kind of kept... Kept it, kept the foot on the gas in that third quarter is what I was looking at. They were plus 13 in that third quarter. And that that's what kind of impressed me is that they were able to come out. They were up, I think, seven at the half. And in in the third quarter, they pummeled them. I mean, you see it a lot in the NBA, in the NBA playoffs specifically. A lot of games are actually won in the third quarter rather than the fourth quarter. It's who is who is going to come out out of that halftime with the adjustments and actually put it to fruition. And that's what Baylor did in this game. They they took it to them in the third quarter so that they didn't have to get out of second gear in the fourth quarter. In fact, they were outscored in the fourth quarter, but they won the game by 17. That's what happens when you're plus 13, plus 12 in the first, plus 13 in the third. Plus 25 in those quarters that you are coming off a of coach talk, I guess. You know, when you're really sitting back having a time to give a game plan in the first quarter, give adjustments in the third, that's when Baylor dominated the game. And so after that, in fact, they got outscored in the other two quarters. But if you are able to, to win those first and thirds, 
the way, I mean, as convincingly as they did, you're you're going to win most games against most teams. And they go against Virginia Tech. That's tonight. The men play at 5-10. I think that's right, 5-10. And then the ladies play at 7. So you're going to be able, be able to basically see both of all of those games, all of both of those games. There we go. And Virginia Tech was impressive in in winning against Marshall on on Friday before that Baylor game against Vanderbilt. And they did it without Elizabeth Kitley. I almost said Zach Kitley, the Texas Tech OC. Uh, Elizabeth Kitley, who is an All-American post, three-time ACC Player of the Year. Like, we are talking about a Virginia Tech Hall of Famer. Like, all time great. I mean, this would be she she tore her ACL. She's out for the season. So she's not a factor in this one. Um, but I mean, we're talking about Kalani Brown, Nina Davis, like going back that far to find, you know, the the caliber of post player that is out for Virginia Tech. And Nikki Collin was asked about this if it if it makes it easier to go after them without Kitley out there. And I thought Nikki had a great answer to this because it's a it's a big part of of why Virginia Tech is so good outside of Liz Kitley. Well what was kind of your initial reaction? Obviously a very sad situation, but you gotta think that, you know, it, it makes the job easier because I mean she's, you know, one of the best in the country. Yeah, I don't um first of all in in this sport when you have someone three time ACC player of the year, um, you know, I think her and and Georgia's kind of games fit so well together, um, ACC champions this year. So I think the timing is really, really tough. Um, you never you never are looking for an easy path. You're just not. Um, sometimes in, in, in particular, you don't, you don't want your players to think that, hey, the task is any easier. Like, I feel like we're not just playing against um, five players tomorrow. We're play, playing against you know, 10,005, um, because I think the energy in this building will be insane. I think um, the people here will take it very, very personally to help this team um, and really be kind of a sixth man um, because of, you know, what Kitley has meant to this program. And I, I, I certainly think they were going to show up either way, but I think um, that's going to be a key. Like, we don't look at the task as easier. Um, we just have to play our best basketball. I love that. We're not looking at going against five players. We're looking at going against 10,005. And that doesn't make it easier is basically what she says in there. Because I think what is so impressive about Virginia Tech's record is, you know, they're they're just over 500 on the road. They're, I think, three and two in neutral sites. And they are 16 and 0 at home. They don't lose at home. And so that's, that was the most daunting thing going into this regional was that this team is playing on their home floor where they have not lost all year. And they may do pretty well without Liz Kitley in that first game. So I, I know it's Marshall and you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to beat him. It's a four versus a 13, but you know, Marshall has a, you know, great press and they put up a lot of shots. And so, you know, they got a style that can, that can stub, stub some toes right against bigger teams and yet i mean virginia tech you know having to adjust in life without kitley they they made no doubt about it <laughs> they just they ran all over them so it, it will be i guess easier of, like I, i'm not going to say it's harder to play against them without kitley but this is still a talented team um and they've got a good backcourt too so it, by no means does that mean wrap it up in a in a green and gold bow but if Baylor shoots like they did on Friday or or near that, 40% or above from three, I feel confident about them. And what I one of the things that I took as a big positive was one of the players that you were really working to get back, get her shot back, was uh, Bella Fauntleroy, who um, was, you know, a little banged up by the end of that conference schedule, as, as they all were. She goes out there, plays 37 minutes, drops 19 and 11. If you're getting that out of Bella Fauntleroy, which is a big ask, I mean, a double-double, but that that's going to win you games in this tournament. Um, Trey Edwards, I was a little surprised. Um, she she wasn't much of a factor in this game. I don't know if there was a little injury concern there, but she played less than 11 minutes, only had seven points. 
Um, Van Guyton beak another great game off the bench uh, with with 10 points and a couple assists. Uh, when she's giving you double figures, that that's big for you. Sarah Andrews looked as good as she has in kind of a while, to be to be honest with you. She was efficient in this game. Uh, 13 points, five assists, only, only played 22 minutes. But when you're getting the platoon guard play that you are from from Jana Van Geitenbeek, if she's giving you 10 points, that that's a great platoon right there. You know, they combine for seven assists and 23 points. That's that's fantastic. I mean, that's that's like having an all American guard, all American point guard just broken up into two. So uh love that for them. And and by the way, I, you know, I talk about those two, but Jada Walker also plays 30 minutes with, with eight points and, and a couple of assists, three assists and four rebounds. So, you know, that that's not a bad stat filler either. Um, if they can get another big game out of Bella Fauntleroy and a gritty, gritty performances from Asia Blackwell and Dariana little page bugs, uh, down low, that's a recipe for Baylor success. And by the way, Asia Blackwell, Goes out there and has eight points and seven rebounds. That's that's kind of automatic for her at, at this point in the season again, uh, which is which is pretty good to have a player who's just getting near a double double every time. Um, so if if she gives out the grit that we know she can and, and kind of lead that team down low, I, I can absolutely see Baylor winning this game. Absolutely can. Oof. Now I'm just excited thinking about these games, man. It's uh, it's nerve wracking here in March, but we are going to talk about coming up how we actually feel these games are going to go. But first, we got to go to our bracket challenge that we do every week. Okay, the March Madness bracket highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that has pushed it further than the rest just like all of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. And I am looking at the Pathfinder, and I am comparing that to the Creighton Blue Jays. Heck of a program Creighton has. They're in the Sweet 16 again. Obviously, they knocked out Baylor last year on their way to the Elite Eight, but they fought tooth and nail to come back late in that game against Oregon, win it in double overtime, and bang, they're in the Sweet 16 again. What a program they have there. Many, many questioned if they were going to be able to make that run. You know, you heard about the Big East, and you heard about Marquette and UConn, and rightfully so, but it's Creighton that was the first one to punch their ticket to the Sweet 16. So. Shout out to the Blue Jays. They're they're my Nissan Pathfinders. You could take the Pathfinder, the Nissan Rogue, or the Nissan Armada and go out and find your next big adventure at shopnissanusa.com. So looking at these two games today, in just a few hours as I'm dropping this episode, I like, I like the Baylor men. I like the Baylor men in this one against Clemson. Um, I, I think it's going to be tooth and nail for a lot of the game, but I think if Baylor plays offense the way they are supposed to, and it's been rare to see Clemson shooting as well as they have had on Friday, two games in a row. They haven't had a lot of that this season. If, if Baylor can shoot the way they are capable of and use the offensive options at their disposal. And if Eve Misi can, can have a big game, which he usually does against top tier, uh, big men then this should be a Baylor victory. And we're and then we're talking about Los Angeles next week and Arizona. But that's a long way off. That's a long 40 minutes from now. And this has been the second the second round's been the demon. They have not surpassed that since since uh since winning the national championship. And things have to go right. And do I think it's a favorable matchup for Baylor? Sure. Sure. Uh but North Carolina was a favorable like Baylor was the favorite in that one. It wasn't the matchup we wanted. We all knew that going in, but Baylor was the favorite in that one. Same with Creighton last year. It wasn't the matchup you necessarily wanted, but Baylor was the favorite. You know, if if I had to choose a second round matchup, I mean, sure, I'd I'd probably rather have it be against Oakland or something than 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 Clemson. But then again, Oakland put them into overtime. So uh, NC State into overtime. So. It's not easy. Never is. We've we've surpassed the easy part. The round of 64 usually is easy. No turning back to that now. So I like Baylor in this one. I think they pull away late. Uh, I, I got them at about... Ooh. Let's go... 
81 to 70. That's actually pretty close to what I had in that goal, that goal gate uh, score prediction, and I was way off on a good way. Looking at the ladies, this this is a chance to get at them. You know, I I know Nikki was trying to downplay it a bit, and she is right. You know, there there is still a good team around Liz Kitley at Virginia Tech, and it's going to be a great atmosphere, a true road game. But I think I think these Bears can get after them, and. Screw it, man. I, I'm not paid by Baylor or nothing, but I'm just going to put it out on the table. All right, I got the Bears in this one. Why not? Let's do it. 69-64, Baylor advances in the women's tournament. I don't know. Why not at this point? Let me know what you think about tonight's game. Drop that down in the comments below. Either one of the games. Drop your score predictions down below. If you think I'm crazy, if you think I'm carrying some water, drop that down in the comments in the, below too. Be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, we Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. We will have post game tonight. We will have breakdown tomorrow. No matter what, whether I'm crying on this podcast or not, we will have it for you. Thank you again again for making it your first listen today and every day we'll be back later with your favorite show which is of course locked on baylor